Hi there, I'm John McMillan, and welcome to another edition of PCB Tech Talk, the podcast where we'll be talking about design tools, the EDA industry, and the questions that you're asking. I'll be bringing in special guests from time to time, including subject matter experts and EDA industry leaders. So be sure to subscribe to this podcast, let me know the topics you'd like to discuss, and if you'd like to be my guest right here on PCB Tech Talk. Engineers, PCB designers, and even marketing and sales, even business execs all understand the value in both time and cost savings for first pass success in printed circuit board designs. Many commercial consumer electronics products have time to market windows of opportunity that are so critical and the competition is so great that the release date can actually make or break the product's success. In this podcast, I explore design for manufacturing analysis, what defines companies as having a best-in-class design flow, and the steps to take to achieve first-pass design success. So, how do we attain first-pass success for PCB designs? How can we ensure that the finished design is correct by design and fully manufacturable? There was an Aberdeen study done entitled Why Printed Circuit Board Design Matters to the Executive that explored and described how PCBs are a strategic asset for cost reduction and faster time to market. The study describes the characteristics and advantages of the best-in-class PCB design practices that actually create opportunities for faster time to market, lower cost, and product differentiation. This may surprise you, but this particular Aberdeen study revealed that a PCB design with moderate complexity may require up to 14 physical prototypes with an average cost of around $8,900 each. To me, that number seems too high. I've read other reports recently that indicate that two to three respins per design is more typical. But regardless of how many, each prototype that's required can impact a project schedule and cost in a big way, especially in critical time-to-market products. Smartphones, for instance, are a very good example of time-sensitive and, and a very competitive product space. So how can we avoid design respins? How can we ensure that designs are manufacturable, that they will perform as spec and reduce prototypes? And are there things we can do throughout the design flow to ensure designs are fabricated and perform as required? Designing for manufacturability should be considered at the beginning of the design flow and continue throughout the entire design cycle. Even in the early stages of design, I'll use component library development for example, accurate LAN patterns are critical. And in designs where components have multiple sources of supply provided, the opportunity for unexpected issues from even the smallest variations in lead sizes and spacings needs to be validated. Here's another example. Since PCBs typically fit into an enclosure, collaboration with mechanical design is also critical early on in the design phase. From obtaining an accurate board outline with mounting holes and keep out areas and clearance checks in every axis of the PCB assembly, discovering and fixing issues prior to fabrication is crucial. And what about signal integrity? With nearly 90% of nets in today's designs having constraint rules that must be set and adhered to to ensure product performance, any alterations by board fabricators who run their own design for manufacturability checks looking for ways to ensure that the PCB is fabricated with concern to their own process cost, materials, and yields. And in some cases, traces may even be tweaked, traces with critical length and spacing rules, and possibly run the risk of impacting your design's signal integrity. EDA tools have come a long way to improve many design for whatever features. Checks like design for tests, design for manufacturability, also other features like real-time ECAD, MCAD collaboration and 3D design environments that provide a view, a virtual prototype even, of the design with all the 3D models of components, enclosures, hardware, perhaps even mating PC cards and cables can help to ensure in product success. So what about DFM analysis? For decades, PCB designers and engineers have developed internal processes to check for and to address specific issues that they have either encountered through experience and or worked with 
PCB fabricators to get recommendations or even create checklists. So for example, PCB fabricators know their equipment and can provide guidance on test point sizes, spacing, coverage, and ratios per net, for example. We, in turn, can use that information to create the spacing constraints, the appropriate pad stack sizes, and appropriate location for test points in our design. What we end up becoming most interested in and try to avoid are what are the DFM issue or issues that might create a fabrication hold on the PCB design after it's been sent out for manufacturing. So we ask ourselves what things that are either beyond what we are able to check for or the tool is unable to detect that may come back to bite us during fabrication. I recall a study done some years ago by PD circuits in Hampstead, New Hampshire, where they collected data over a six month period on designs submitted for fabrication. And they discovered that more than one fourth of designs were put on hold because issues were discovered. Issues like copper to board edge spacing, the discovery of unterminated traces, and insufficient annular rings were most common. So now I guess it's a great time to mention that when DFM analysis checks were performed prior to sending the PCB to fab, that two-thirds of those fabrication holds could have been prevented. To me, that's pretty compelling. I don't have to tell you this, but when jobs are put on hold, schedules slip, cost increase, and the extra time required to manage and respend designs is rarely accounted or budgeted for. Even worse, if there are issues that don't get detected until after fabrication, designs get scrapped. Improving design quality, which in turn reduces respends, is to have design for manufacturing analysis functionality integrated directly into your EDA tool design environment. That is, DFM analysis and checks created specifically to identify manufacturability issues throughout the design flow. The types of items that DFM analysis can expose range from the three items I mentioned earlier, copper to board edge spacing, unterminated traces, and insufficient annular rings, to issues like the discovery of photoresist slivers, silt screen, overlapping pads, thermal pad connectivity loss, missing solder paste, and, and so on. Having integrated DFM analysis is not only smart, but it also can provide a huge competitive advantage with respect to avoiding major product issues because it reduces fabrication, assembly, test, and manufacturing issues. When DFM analysis is run and violations are identified, you want the ability to immediately locate, review, and correct the critical violations. And since results can identify different thresholds of severity, that is, that can take into account different design technologies for example, let's say most nominal and least environments, designers can walk through each issue detected and make decisions and corrections as necessary. So I mentioned the Aberdeen study earlier and, and the term best in class for PCB design. You're probably interested to know what the top performers, those identified as best in class, that is what companies that are realizing a competitive advantage are doing to achieve their success. Well, they all identify characteristics in five key categories. The first was process. That is the approach they take to improve PCB design, their best practices. Number two was organization, which defines the ownership of processes and collaboration among stakeholders. This is particularly important in big companies with large design teams. Number three was knowledge management. That is, how data is managed and exposed to the key stakeholders. Collaboration is a real key there. Number four is performance management. That is metrics they capture to track in order to improve processes and in turn business results. We all learn from experiences and continually improve processes going forward. And of course, the fifth category is technology. That of course is the design tools used and those that enhance and support PCB design. By the way, I'll supply a link to this study so that you can read the complete report in the podcast show notes so you don't have to worry about memorizing or writing anything down. Um, so let me drill down into the technology category for a moment. That is the PCB design tool. 
First, let me go down the list of the specific areas of PCB design that these companies deemed as necessary for best-in-class performers. That is, they had design tools with the highest percentage uses of these specific capabilities. And I'll read these in the order that they were ranked. First was a centralized part library. Next was signal integrity analysis. Then thermal analysis. Next was design for manufacturability tools followed by multi-database component searching tools, then integrated MCAD, ECAD collaboration, and then an advanced fabrication tool. So as I mentioned earlier, it starts with the parts. DFM analysis and of course collaboration are key attributes that best-in-class companies focus on for best-in-class performance. Now let's talk about some areas in PCB design that DFM may, DFF, DFA, DFT, etc. may not consider, but can impact the design. I wrote an article recently that was published in the March 2016 issue of Printed Circuit Design and Fab entitled Six Pillars of PCB DFMA Success. In this article, I discuss some of the items I've mentioned in this podcast on DFM analysis further, but I also point out a few other items that should be considered and that can impact the overall design. Things like, are any parts unnecessary? And can they be eliminated? I described a scenario I face in which a design engineer placed an educated quantity of, of bypass and bulk capacitors on a single schematic page, wanting them distributed, and what the impact might be if there were leftovers, or what about the savings of space that could be gained in conditions where a resistor network could be used versus individual components. Understanding if you can save board real estate, even something as simple as gaining space for silkscreen reference designators, particularly on dense designs. I also ask you to consider if the design is over constrained or are any constraints deemed to be unnecessary. Both of these items can have an impact on density if determined to be unnecessary. I'll also add a link to the article in Printed Circuit Design and Fab in the podcast show notes if you're interested in reading that. So does your PCB design flow rely purely on built-in DRC, DFM, and DFA checks and utilities to check design validation prior to fabrication? And once those built-in checks are passed, do you generate the fabrication package, that is all the CAM files and other data files that are required for the PCB to be manufactured and then wait to hear back from the manufacturer to discover if any issues are uncovered during their pre-fabrication design review? When issues are discovered by the fabricator, the job can be put on hold, and issues need to be responded to immediately. Having to fix issues identified by manufacturing not only delays production and potentially the time to market of the design, and it can very well impact the schedule for the designer's next project. In today's competitive marketplace, companies cannot afford to have PCB production delayed because of slivers, unintended copper exposed by solder mass, test point to test point spacing issues, or any other issues that should be identified and accounted for throughout the layout and before the design is even sent out to be manufactured. Catching DFM issues at the design stage is critical because at each successive step of the production process, the cost to rectify a problem can increase tenfold over the previous step. Though often thought of as a post-design process, design for fabrication analysis checks are a critical part of the PCB design that should be considered throughout the entire design flow. And since designs are becoming smaller, faster, and more complex, making corrections, especially in dense designs, can be very time consuming. So how many respins of a design do you typically have? Imagine the savings of both time and cost if you could reduce that number even by just eliminating one respin. By employing design for manufacturing analysis in your PCB design flow, you can help to ensure the lowest possible product cost, the fastest possible process cycle time, and the highest possible first pass yield. Well, thanks for listening. I'm John McMillan, and as always, be sure to check out the podcast show notes. There you'll find the links to the articles and documents that I referred to throughout this podcast, as well as my email address where you can send me your comments and questions. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast and catch the next episode of PCB Tech Talk.